So I want to begin today by noting that it's 2015, and that is the 50th anniversary of the Elementary and Secondary Education Act. And of course, that is the law that became the infamous... Yes, No Child Left Behind. And also right now, in the winter of 2015, No, no Child Left Behind is up for reauthorization, which means that Democrats and Republicans in Congress are very busy debating its future. And as many of you know, Lyndon B. Johnson was the president that signed the Elementary and Secondary Education Act in 1965. And I'm sure as many of you also know, he himself was a public school teacher. So that's where I want to begin my story today. In 1928, LBJ was 20 years old. He had actually dropped out of college for a little while. And a girlfriend of his thought it would be fun to take a public school teaching job in rural South Texas. And he wanted to follow her. So that's how he became a teacher. He followed this girlfriend of his, her name was Carol, to South Texas. And he got a job teaching at the Wellhausen School in a small, dusty cattle village called Catulla. The students there were the children of Mexican-American laborers. It was a segregated school. There were no white children at the school. The kids lived in houses with no indoor plumbing. They had no electricity in their homes. In fact, LBJ wrote home to his mother, asking her to send 250 tubes of toothpaste, because the kids did not have toothpaste to brush their teeth. Now remember, this is 1928. And LBJ is the only male teacher at the Wellhausen School, so he is immediately named principal, just on that fact alone. Uh, and he does a couple interesting things at the school. He launches a debate team. He assigns the children to recite and memorize poetry. He starts after-school tutoring for the kids. And he also did some things that we know are not a good idea today in 2015. He spanked kids who he caught speaking English in class. Now, he stayed in this job only a year, but it was probably one of the most formative years of his life, as I think many teachers will say their first year teaching is. And it was 37 years later that he signed the Elementary and Secondary Education Act, and he sat next to Miss Kate Loney, who had been his own elementary school teacher, as he signed the bill, in his hometown of Johnson City, Texas. And he made a very um, sort of beautiful, optimistic statement about teaching when he signed the bill, and I want to tell you what he said. He said, as a son of a tenant farmer, I know that education is the only valid passport from poverty. As a former teacher, and I hope a future one, I have great expectations of what this law will mean for all of our young people. So when we hear LBJ's words, we can hear that there have long been high expectations on schools and teachers, particularly to close inequality gaps and address poverty. There's nothing new about the debate that we've been having since No Child Left Behind about the role of teachers in schools in closing poverty gaps. But what I'd like to suggest today is that those high hopes in teaching as a political profession, a profession that addresses our social ills, go back even further in American history to the early 19th century. And yet, despite these high hopes, since the early 19th century, we've often been as a nation disappointed in the work our teachers do. Why? Why have we had this contrast of high expectations and disappointment? And how can we break this unproductive cycle? To answer this question today, I'd like to introduce five lessons from history for those of us who care about quality teaching in 2015. The first lesson is that teachers are typically portrayed by policymakers in one of two equally unrealistic ways. The first way is as angels or superheroes. I'm going to give you some quotes throughout history to sort of bring this, um, bring this to bear. Horace Mann, of course, he was the first state secretary of education, the father of the common schools movement. In 1853, he described his ideal teacher, and I'm quoting him. As a teacher of schools, how divinely does she come, her feet sweetening the earth on which she treads, and the celestial radiance of her benignity, making vice begin its work of repentance through very envy of the beauty of virtue. 
Now to translate that into 21st century English, Arnie Duncan, our Secretary of Education in 2009 said, an effective teacher, they walk on water. So again, it's this idea of teachers as angels or almost religious figures. Now the second unrealistic portrayal of teachers is as constantly failing. This is what I mean when I say in my book that teaching is the most embattled profession in America and that it is subject to moral panics, which means that teachers are blamed for large social problems that really extend far outside schools. Now, Catherine Beecher was the sister of Harriet Beecher Stowe. Harriet Beecher Stowe was the author of Uncle Tom's Cabin. The Beecher family was very active in 19th century reform politics, and Catherine was an education reformer. And her big issue was bringing women into the classroom. In 1800, 90% of American teachers were male. And Catherine didn't like this. She thought men were unsuitable teachers. She thought women would do a better job. And she thought that the key to improving education for kids was getting women to be teachers. So in 1846, here's how she describes those male teachers. She says they are, quote, incompetent, intemperate, coarse, hard, unfeeling, lazy, and stupid, unquote. So that's 1846 male teachers. Now, by the late 19th century, by the 1890s, 90% of teachers were female in northern cities like New York and Chicago. And then reformers were singing a different tune. They determined that women were actually the problem with teaching, and the way to improve education was to get men back into the classroom. And Charles William Eliot was one of those folks who believed that. He was the president of Harvard. So here's what he had to say about women. Female teachers are physically weaker than men, more apt to be worn out by the fatiguing work of teaching. The average skill of the teachers in the public schools may be increased by raising the present low proportion of male teachers in the schools. Therein lies the great cause of the inferiority of the American teaching to the French and German teaching. Now, if we fast forward to the World War I era, there was a Red Scare. And this concerned pacifist or leftist socialist teachers who were in public schools and the concern that they were teaching unpatriotic values to American students. So I'm going to quote the New York Times editorial board in 1917. They wrote, the Board of Education should root out all the disloyal or doubtful teachers. This little private war of these misguided or out of equilibrium persons on the United States must stop. They must be put out of the schools. And if they continue to express sedition publicly, they must be locked up. And hundreds of teachers did in fact lose their jobs in these red scares in New York City and thousands and thousands across the country. And I'm happy to report that the rhetoric has somewhat softened. <laughs> Since then, we're not calling for widespread arrests of teachers. Um, but we still hear this kind of idea that all teachers or most teachers are failing. In the late 1990s, David Levin, who's the co-founder of the KIPP Charter School, said the following, we need an entirely new teaching workforce. There are some great teachers out there, but they've been mixed among a bad element for too long. And as I point out in my book, teaching is consistently the only profession mentioned in State of the Union addresses. So for example, in 2011, President Obama promised in his State of the Union speech to quote unquote, stop making excuses for bad teachers. There was no other profession that was mentioned. What I think is that when we notice our education debate has become especially hostile to teachers, or even consumed with calling out bad teachers or focusing on the worst of the worst teachers, we should be skeptical that this is productive. Why? Well, it has to do with the immense scale of the teaching profession. There are 3.3 million teachers in the United States. 100,000 to 200,000 new public school teachers are hired every September and 70,000 of those teachers are hired in low-income schools. Now, for my book, I interviewed many teacher quality reformers across the country, people who believe there's a problem and want to make teaching more effective in the United States. And they told me that 2 to 15% of the current teacher corps is ineffective. So the vast majority are effective, but 2 to 15% are not. Now, 2 to 15% of 3.3 million 
is 66,000 to 495,000 people. 66,000 to 495,000 people. We cannot fire our way to the top because there is no reliable pipeline of for sure better teachers to fill all these jobs that would theoretically open if we fired up to half a million people. Lesson two, because of this huge scale, we must keep alternative certification programs in perspective. Now Teach for America brings about 6,000 teachers annually into our public schools. This accounts for less than 10% of open positions in low-income schools. And Teach for America is not the first program of its kind. I mentioned Katherine Beecher. Now in the 1850s, she launched the Board of National Popular Education, which brought East Coast girls, well-educated girls from New York and Massachusetts and Vermont, to the West to open single-room schoolhouses in the frontier. And then from the 1960s to the 1980s, we had the National Teacher Corps. This was another program that was founded by President Johnson, and this asked elite college grads to both teach and perform community service while actually living in poor urban neighborhoods. Now on the upside, these alternative certification programs have brought more academically elite folks into the teaching profession, and they tend to be more diverse in terms of race. But on the downside, these teachers have much less longevity in the classroom, and these programs operate at a truly small scale, and it's not clear that they can be scaled up while retaining what's good about them, which is their diversity and their selectivity. Lesson three. The demand for data-driven school reform, especially through teacher evaluation, is perennial. I already mentioned Horace Mann, the nation's first state secretary of education. Now, during his tenure in the 1840s and 1850s in Massachusetts, he shifted schools from giving students oral exams in which the kids would stand up in front of the class and recite what they had learned to written standardized tests. Because if you had the kids' answers written down on paper, you could collect this data and you could hold both students and their teachers accountable for certain productivity targets. In researching my book, I found that merit pay for teachers tied to point-based evaluation systems dates back at least to 1915, where it was instituted in Atlanta. And it was instituted in Atlanta at that time in large part to cut budgets. And in fact, when merit pay for teachers in Atlanta was tried in 1915, the overall spending on teacher salaries went down, which was the policymakers' goal for this at the time. Then in the 1920s and 1930s, something emerged called the pupil change method, and it was spearheaded by social scientists. Now, <laughs> the pupil change method entailed the following. You would look at students' test scores at the beginning of the year, and then you would look at them at the end of the year, and you would attribute the gain or the decrease to the teacher. And if this sounds very familiar, which I hope it does, it's because it's basically the exact same thing as value-added measurement. Now, value-added measurement has been presented in our education reform debate since the early 1990s as a big new innovation. But in fact, it was operational in the 1920s and 1930s under this other name, pupil change method. And the pupil change method was tested on college math instructors at Iowa State. The best college math instructors produced 3% of gains for their students compared to the worst. And it was a small but significant effect size. And what's really interesting to me about it is that 3% gain is the same effect size that we're seeing in most of the touted value-added studies in terms of the difference between the best teachers and the average teacher. So not much has changed there. Now what happened in the 20s and 30s when districts started to actually implement the people change method to evaluate teachers? Well, sometimes the results were disappointing. William Maxwell was the superintendent of the New York City schools in 1898. He became the superintendent. And he was very upset and frustrated because 99.5% of teachers were rated good on their evaluations. And at the time, it was a good, fair, poor evaluation system. So he wanted to change that system. And he instituted a new system where principals were given teachers ratings of A, B, C, or D. And these grades were you know, calculated on these long spreadsheets with many different factors. And of course, back then you filled in the spreadsheet by hand, so it wasn't a computer-generated process like today. 
And initially, there was a burst of enthusiasm among education reformers for this new system. But by 1919, the New York Times reported that educators in the city considered it a joke. Why? There was so much paperwork involved that principals were not sort of honestly or productively filling out these spreadsheets. They were rushing through the motions, and it turned out that basically every teacher got a B plus. So it was the exact same problem that the new system was supposed to address. It just replicated the same problem over again. Now, there's no um, political party or side of the spectrum that has owned this type of policy idea. The right, left, and everyone in between have used student test scores to try to hold teachers accountable at different points in our history. In the late 1960s, black power activists on the left cited the fact that students in majority non-white New York City public schools were two grade levels behind on standardized tests compared to their peers in majority white schools. And they used this fact to argue for community control of schools and power to fire tenured teachers. Lesson four, there are some sorts of data we pay less attention to than others. So for example, probably many of you here have heard of the study by three economists, Chetty, Friedman, and Rokoff, which found that students who had one high value added teacher seemed to earn more money later on as adults. What you probably haven't heard of is another study by three other economists, Jackson, Johnson, and Persico. That study found that through 2011, a 10% increase in per pupil school funding led to students earning 7.25% higher wages until they reached their 40s. The other study only looked at kids until they were 25. So again, we've heard a lot about the correlation between test scores and income, much less so about the correlation between per pupil spending and income later in life. Another robust research finding that you might not have heard about is that too much test prep is counterproductive. And here I want to call your attention to the work of two cognitive scientists, Andrew Butler and Henry Rodiger, as well as to the MET project, which was the Gates Foundation's effort to videotape thousands of classrooms around the country and see what teachers were actually doing with their time. Both of those studies found that teachers who focus more on writing with their students and non-multiple choice assessments throughout the year, their students actually have larger gains on those bubble tests at the end of the year than teachers who spent the whole year passing out mock bubble tests and drilling the kids on worksheets. And another finding from the MET project that you may not have heard about. Only 14 to 37 percent of teachers' observation scores, so the scores that principals and other assessors gave teachers when they observed their classrooms, could be attributed to the teacher's actual practice. So I know this sounds strange, so let me repeat it. Only 14 to 37 percent of the teacher's observation score had to do with anything that the teacher had control over. And in fact, teachers of poorer students were systematically discriminated against. So they systematically earned lower scores, even if they were doing the exact same actions in front of their kids. Now this calls into question the very idea of objective and fair teacher evaluation regardless of the socioeconomic status of students which as we all know in this room has been a major thrust of current education reform efforts. Another research finding. The segregation of poor non-white children impacts achievement in measurable ways. In Montgomery County, Maryland, poor students who were placed by lottery in predominantly middle class schools experienced eight points of gains in math and four points of gains in reading compared to poor children in majority poor schools. And that's a finding from the Century Foundation study by Heather Schwartz. The economists Stephen Billings, David Deming, Jonah Rokoff, and Byron Lutz have shown that student test scores and graduation rates can decline and arrest rates for kids go up when court-ordered desegregation plans end. Teacher working conditions matter. When teachers have trusting relationships with principals and with parents, when they feel they have adequate supplies in their classrooms, support on student discipline, 
test scores go up. And you're interested in that body of research, it's quite robust, and I recommend the book Trust in Schools by Anthony Brick and Barbara Schneider. And one thing I want to talk about that I think is really important and is very little discussed is that career longevity for teachers does matter for kids. Matthew Ronfelt, Susanna Loeb, and James Wyckoff conducted an eight-year study of 850,000 850, fourth and fifth graders right here in New York. And they found that in schools with high teacher turnover, meaning many teachers were leaving at the end of each year, students lost significant amounts of learning in both math and reading compared to socioeconomically identical peers at schools with low teacher turnover. And crucially, students at the high turnover schools lost learning gains even if their own teacher was not new. So even if my teacher had been there for 15 years, if the teacher in the classroom next door left, that impacted me. Now, it might seem counterintuitive, but actually, if we think about schools as communities, it makes perfect sense. Turnover means administrators are recruiting, interviewing, hiring when they could be focused on instruction. And when many teachers resign each year, institutional memory is lost, and there are fewer veterans around to train the newbies. Which brings me to lesson five. We have typically done education reform to teachers, rarely with teachers. And I don't mean to say that we should let the structure and performance of the current teaching profession off the hook. Far from it. As I write in my book, there are good reasons to focus more on performance and less on seniority, we should think critically about whether the structure of teacher pay scales is enticing young people into the profession and encouraging them to stay there. And there's plenty to do, and I know you're working on it here, to make sure teacher education is more closely tied to the pragmatic realities of the classroom. Rather, what I mean is that the starting point for improving teaching should be what can be observed by watching the best teachers work and allowing teachers to watch one another. Let me give you some examples. The Children's Literacy Initiative has developed research-backed techniques to help early learners read and write. But instead of lecturing to teachers in stultifying professional development sessions, CLI establishes a model classroom in each school in which it works. That model classroom has an open door Novice teachers have time to watch the master teacher use these literacy strategies, and the master teacher, in turn, watches novices teach and offers him or her feedback. Students in Philadelphia, Newark, Camden, and Chicago schools with model classrooms are outperforming their peers in reading. In my book, I cover a number of efforts nationwide to deploy and replicate teachers' own expertise. At Kingsbury High School in Memphis, one third of all teachers are working under the residency model in which trainee teachers spend their first year as an apprentice in a model teacher's classroom. Teachers who participate in these residencies as recruits or mentors have longer career longevity and in many cities have produced impressive learning games. And at Crenshaw High School in Los Angeles, a group of teachers banded together to work with local universities to develop a common core aligned curriculum all about life in South LA, the neighborhood in which their students live. The students learned about the history of public housing across the United States. Many of them lived in public housing. And in math class, they graphed relationships between income and incarceration in their neighborhood. Now, participating in programs like these helps teachers actually improve their practice by collaborating with their teacher peers and it allows them to feel intellectual and creative ownership over their work. I want to read you something I learned and heard from Christina Jean, a public school social studies teacher in Denver, Colorado, who I met while I was working on my book. Christina told me, a lot of the discourse is about getting rid of bad teachers. Very rarely do I perceive teachers shown as anything other than cogs in a machine. But to improve teaching, the job must be challenging and stimulating to adults. I am an adult. I am an intelligent person who has this love and passion for educating kids. So let me use what I know 
to create an experience for my students that reflects my expertise. Now, history teaches us that in the end, real educational improvement will be built not upon our fears of the worst teachers, but upon the expertise and leadership of the best teachers like Christina, guiding their colleagues to excellence. Thank you.